Um, thank you so much for showing up on, is this the last talk of the day? And you're still here, you're not at the bar, you're listening to me, that's touching. Yes, I will try to make it good. This talk is called The Four Types of Locks, and it shall become clear, hopefully, in a second what I mean, because a lot of people who've seen me speak before, they say, man, I've seen more than four types of locks in your pockets, let alone like what you carry in these. There's a million types of locks. And what I mean by this is, no, it's not about styles and designs of lock. It's really helpful to think of locks in four really broad categories. It's the best way, in my opinion, to try to build a physical security framework for yourselves and I'm actually cobbling around in my own noggin up here what could become a physical security framework for companies because the standards out there are really, really abysmal. In case you don't know, you haven't seen me bouncing around at different conferences, I sort of show up in random odd places and do a lot of things with locks and physical security. You can usually tell by how I'm dressed where, where you're seeing me. If you're seeing me in like nice shirt mode, I'm with my company, the core group, you know, wearing pants and things like that. But Yes, we do auditing and physical assessment and training and lock forensics for proper companies. If you see me in black t-shirt mode, I'm with Tool running some sort of hands-on workshop or other fun play area teaching your kids how to get out of handcuffs and things like that. And I always enjoy, when how many people have come by one of the Tool areas and actually tried some picking at events? Excellent. We will have a whole lock pick village going on here at Source tomorrow. So all the things you're seeing today, you will not only learn how to do it from me, you'll learn how to do it yourselves, hands-on, here in this exact conference. Fun. I also, as I was joking with Gadsden earlier, I do a lot of fun stuff with firearms. Uh, I'm very into physical security of that nature. I travel with firearms a lot, and that became a whole other field of expertise, and I learned way more than I ever thought I would learn about how airlines and highways and all the different laws work. So if you ever travel with firearms or you want to, talk to me later. It's in a bar. Like, I'll tell you a million fun things. It's not hard. It's actually sometimes really, really cool. That's a different talk of mine. But we're here today to talk about locks. We're here to talk about which locks are which, which ones are good. Here's a bunch of locks that look very similar, the popular square body padlock all on a shelf. These are different brands. Are they the same inside? Are they different? How do you know when a lock is high security? What does that even mean? Here we have a nice selection of high, do you think these locks are very high security, right? Yeah, they're badass. Put them on your server room, you'll, you'll be great. Um, yes, why do locks matter and why do we distinguish between them? Why do we need to know this? Well, it comes down to the job you're trying to do. Every one of you, or most of you, I imagine, are responsible for a lot of pieces of equipment that look like this, and you have to secure them and configure them correctly and patch everything and make sure all your networks are segmented just right. And you can be doing all of that, probably helping your company out a lot, and I respect all the work you do. If you or someone else at your company didn't pay attention to locks, however, I can stroll in with a console cable on a red team audit and really ruin your day. You could have all the you know, phone calls between your different offices through crypto you know, connections and your, well, your PBX is talking to your San Francisco PBX and it's all locked down. I still guarantee you somewhere in your office, there's a room that looks like this with a bunch of copper just going up to everyone's desk. If I get into this room with you know, some alligator clips and a butt pack, all those crypto phone calls suddenly are belong to us. It's not really helping you out. Your physical security is your data security and vice versa. All of your hard work, everything you're doing or everything your boss is doing or everything you know, your associate team is doing, all of this that you do here is great. Don't let it get ruined here by really bad decisions walking through Home Depot. That's the crux of what I'm gonna tell you about today. There are four grades of locks and I kind of categorize them in different ways. The first grade that I talk about is quote, the lowest grade of lock or the locks you are most likely using where you don't realize it. How bad are a lot of these locks and how prevalent are they? Well, it's pretty rotten. You may not know, hey sweetie, that most of the, the, the locks you use, whether they are you know, deadbolts, doorknobs, padlocks, they look very different, but you guys should understand they're all the same lock inside. These are all just different form factors of what's called a pin tumbler lock. In the, in the, here in North America, it is the most common lock everywhere. Inside, what's actually happening, because you're going to learn this right now. You're actually not going to just get a quick spiel. You're going to learn picking itself. Woohoo! Inside, what's actually going on? Well, this round part that turns when you're operating the lock is called the plug. And if you look just right down the keyway, you know, peer into some of these, you know, locks around. Don't, like, mess with them, but just look into locks or, like, look into locks that you might have in your room. You'll probably even see a little piece of a pin. Many of you do know, and you've heard the term pin tumbler lock, you might know that locks work with pins somehow. 
What you'll never see, however, unless you completely strip the lock apart, and imagine we cut the face right off this, inside of a pin tumbler lock, it's not a single pin doing a job usually, it's a pair of pins called a pin stack. So right now, this plug can't turn if we don't put a key in it because the pin stack is not in the right position. Shown in blue is called the driver pin, and that pin is binding right now. It's only if you stick your key into the lock, your key rides along the key pin, shown in red, pushes on the pin stack just the right amount, lets everything turn nice and even and clear. That's the same design that Linus Yale created back in the UK ages ago, and we still use it today. That is all that's happening in most of your locks. Does this make sense so far? Excellent. You're like halfway to being a locksmith at this point. Now, of course, it's not a single pin stack in the lock. There are a series of them. The more you have, usually people are like, oh, there's more security because I got more pins. Well, yes and no. All of the driver pins are the same in this lock, but notice the key pins are different sizes. The different size key pins correspond to different heights on the blade of the key, known as the bitting of the key. That's how a key is different from another key, is different from somebody else's key. All those cuts represent different sizes of bottom pin, of key pin, that have to be distinct and accurate. And of course, if just one of those pins is a little off, oh, well, I'll show you that in a second. Sorry. So inside the lock, you've seen diagrams, you've seen some animations, but you've never really seen a photo until now. And unless you've carved a lock open, you've probably never seen this with your own eyes. Understand that this is supposed to be a beautiful and you know, supremely perfect world where everything is lined up, everything's measured just right. Ideally, that's how the lock would work, flat and true and even and flush every time. Actual locks, as anyone who's worked in the hardware space knows, anything you manufacture, you send out to a fab lab, you pay for tolerances. You pay for how accurately your milling and machining is going to be. All locks will have some imperfection in the actual production process. So these chambers that are drilled to hold the pin stacks, they're not perfect in every way. These pins weren't milled beautifully, and it looks like a couple of them have even seen better days. The plug chambers also can be a little sloppy, a little bit different size, different alignment. All of these imperfections line up and cause the lock to not behave in that gorgeous, pristine, sort of animated way you just saw. Here's another animation. Imagine we've stripped the lock completely apart. So the plug has been removed, and it's on the left side here. We're looking at it kind of down from above. All those chambers, right where they should be, perfectly drilled. And again, we're trying to turn this plug with no key. All those driver pins are binding, 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 as they should, right? But think about those imperfections that I just described to you. Think about how many locks are not this good. In fact, no lock is perfect, perfect. Some come close, but some locks are really bad. Some locks, I mean, this is you know, misaligned, a little bit wrong shape. You think this is exaggerated sort of to make it visually appealing, and maybe it is, but not in all instances. Really cheap locks, absolutely. You can just look at them, naked eye, and be like, oh God, who milled this? Those imperfections cause the binding process to not happen universally across all the pin stacks. So whatever pin is the most misaligned, like the one that's really hanging out further, that one hits first, and the rest of these pins aren't binding, even though we're trying to turn the plug. Does that make sense? Well, because of that, because locks will bind one pin stack at a time, you can attack them one pin stack at a time. It comes back to what I said, how more pins is not necessarily more secure. Someone might say, well, I'll have a really big key space because I'll make a lock that's like seven pins deep. And there are some seven pin locks. I've seen eight pin locks. Beyond that, it just gets silly because it looks like you're carrying a sword around on your keychain. <laughs> And also because you're not really buying yourself more security. Yes, your key space is huge. It's unlikely that your key would ever accidentally line up with some other guy's key. But just in terms of resisting attack, more pins isn't really doing it for you. With binding pins setting one at a time, you can do what's called manually setting the pins into position one at a time. A little bit of pressure on the plug. Let's resume this again. A little bit of pressure will cause a pin, of course, to bind somewhere. If you then put lifting force on the pin stack, you'll eventually click it into position where it should have been. You'll, you know, it has nowhere else to go. It's going to eventually just reach the height that it should have reached with a proper key. When you reach that height, this pin stack is no longer binding and the plug actually can turn a little bit. It can't open, but it can turn just enough to hang up that driver pin. Does everyone see that? The driver pin actually gets caught on the lip of the 